uh, we've got a bit of an unusual situation. Now, this first portion of the radar cycle, fairly bland and typical, but then you see these bands of very distinct cloud cover moving into the region. That is not rain, that is not snow, believe it or not. Military aircraft flying through the region is dropping chaff. Small bits of aluminum, sometimes it's made of plastic or uh, even uh, metallicized, uh, metallicized paper products, but it's used as an anti-radar issue and obviously they're up there practicing. Now they won't confirm that, but I was in the Marine Corps for many years and I'll tell you right now, that's what it is. So let's say we were doing geoengineering because we wanted to make uh, the weather a little bit better. There will be monsoon failures during that period, there will be huge hurricanes. The global studies indicate there will be some impact on precipitation patterns. It might involve large-scale regional agricultural disruption lasting a number of years. Potentially, two billion people could have their food disrupted by such interventions. That the aerosols can, at least in these model simulations, or indicated by these simulations, can offset most climate change in most places most of the time for both precipitation and runoff. But it's likely to cause some damage in some places. Uh, reactions to aluminum is intense inflammation. 
uh, an activation of cells in the brain that are the immune cells called microglia. Uh, aluminum is a very potent activator of these uh, immune cells, and that triggers the release of uh, a powerful substance called glutamate, which is an excitotoxin that causes uh, cells to die from an excitatory mechanism, kind of complex mechanism, but it it uh, is a combination of inflammation and excitotoxicity. And I coined the term in the medical literature <clears throat> called immunoexcitotoxicity to describe that process. So we know that occurs. We know it occurs very easily. Now, the reports are coming out now that what they're spraying is nano-sized aluminum, and the idea is the, the old uh, concept of preventing global warming. And they nano-size the aluminum so it'll stay in the upper atmosphere longer, supposedly as a reflective uh, uh, compound, uh, a metal. Uh, the problem with that, even from a climatologic uh, description, is that if you make it into cirrus like clouds rather than reflecting it upward and out of the atmosphere, it reflects the heat downward and actually causes global warming. So the... Uh, you know, you could envision that they're doing its own purpose to make the atmosphere heat up so they can see, see the atmosphere is warming up. But uh, what I'm concerned about mainly is the medical effect, and that's because of the very strong connection between aluminum passing through this pathway into the brain uh, is so strongly connected with Alzheimer's disease uh, and other diseases of memory. Uh, if you're aerosolizing this and uh, spraying literally tons of it over the world uh, and people are constantly breathing that uh, aerosolized nano-sized aluminum, which will easily penetrate uh, filters in your uh, air conditioning system, uh, enter your home. So you're breathing it 24 hours a day, uh, producing high levels of aluminum. Uh, in this part of the brain, and uh, the consequences could be absolutely devastating. It could cause a huge increase in uh, Alzheimer's disease and uh, inflammatory neurological disorders. Uh, now, I watched a uh, YouTube, which was a geoengineering conference that the government had uh, put on. And in the conference, uh, one of the questions somebody in the audience asked, well, what is the medical effect of spraying aluminum in the atmosphere? And the speaker said, well, uh, we don't really know, uh, but we're in the process of researching that. Well, of course, that was an absolute lie. We do know what it does. But uh, the fact that uh, they, they were admitting that, in uh, fact, they were going to spray, uh, they gave it in the, in the future tense, that they were going to spray aluminum. Uh, the evidence now from um, the uh, examination by a biologist and, and uh uh, scientists around the world is that the aluminum level in the lakes and streams and trees and, uh, is increasing enormously. Uh, some areas have uh, incredible elevations of aluminum in the, in the groundwater uh, and in the, the vegetation. So uh, if this indeed is happening, uh, we're looking at a, a medical catastrophe. is what many are calling the chemtrail geoengineering footprint of aluminum, barium, and strontium. So we're finding this well-thought footprint internationally, all over the world, wherever they take samples and get a uh, chemical analysis of rain and snow water. This is quite common. Wherever you see the jet chemtrails go over, you're going to get aluminum, barium, strontium coming down. Why would we not believe it's happening when what we see in the sky matches exactly the express goal of numerous geoengineering patents, about 160 or more? Why would we not believe this is happening when every element showing up in the rain tests are the primary elements named in those geoengineering patents? Why would we not believe this is happening when we have escalating levels in very short time frames, as much as short as five years, we see rain levels of aluminum, for example, escalating as much as 50,000 percent. California air quality studies do not show these metals migrating from China. And 
it's of recent origin. So, you know, this bombardment of heavy metals that's raining down on us is, is coming from somewhere. Why would we not believe geoengineering is occurring when the weather patterns are so altered here in exactly the manner stated by geoengineers and reports on the consequences for geoengineering, which are diminished rainfall, which are increased ozone destruction. We have a massive ozone hole in the Northern Hemisphere now. It should aluminum be in the soil in the rain. And yes, it should be in the soil. It's naturally there, always was there. And should it be in the rain? Well, absolutely not. But the standard reply has been, your samples are contaminated but since we are getting samples now that show zero aluminum and we're getting lots of barium and strontium and zero aluminum. So that just proves that if there was dirt in our samples of some sort, dust blown up from the ground, we should get some aluminum in some detectable quantity. The primary ingredients in geoengineering are specifically the oxides of metals, including aluminum oxide. This is devastating to plants, totally devastating. The trees are dying. Why? Approximately two years ago, I rode in the back, and you can ride in the back of my place for miles. You can go all the way through the woods, you know, creeks and everything, and it was, I say was, gorgeous. And the day before yesterday, I took a ride, and I rode in the back, and what I found was total devastation. As I pointed out before, Michael, we're seeing as in this example here, very hardy native plants completely flash out dead. That looks like it's been hit with some kind of a chemical. And we've only seen this in the last couple of years. And there's another one there, there, back over there. We're seeing mature madrone trees, which are 70, 80 feet high, flash out dead just like this. USDA refuses to investigate it. The pH typically around here should be about 5.6. Well, since the contrailing got heavy, I watched the pH here in these forests, well, go up, I guess would be the word. From 5.6, it went about 20 times more alkaline. Well, they say the government is dumping chemicals on us to control or manipulate the weather. And they say the unusual looking jet trails in the sky are actually chemical laden chemtrails. It's a belief gaining popularity here in Colorado. So is there really poison in the sky? Fox 31's Heidi Hammett investigates. Poison. Who paints the morning sky? Lines in the sky. Brilliant, bright, white, blue. Strange circles. What chemicals they use, I do not know. Peculiar patterns. And I saw grids and grids, planes flying back and forth. For thousands of people in Colorado. I think they're spraying chemicals. Across the country and around the world. It's scary. It is very scary. It is a mile-high mystery. They say when you see those jet contrails in the sky that don't disappear, that's proof that the government is using planes to spray chemicals into the atmosphere to manipulate or control the weather. Turning normal jet contrails into chemical trails or chemtrails. Because they're using government planes that are unmarked. And while some call the concept crazy. So when they say, no, there's nothing going on, I don't believe them. Rosalind Peterson says it's anything but. I think that this is terribly serious in the United States. The former USDA crop inspector, who was invited to speak at the UN conference on climate change in 2007, has been tracking the government's research on weather modification and something called geoengineering. A way of fighting global warming by putting chemicals like aluminum and barium into the atmosphere to create clouds which reflect the sun's rays. Geoengineering um, is to make a change which is unnatural. She says the suspicious looking sky shows the government is already experimenting with the weather. And that's why health department records show a sharp increase in barium and aluminum in California's water supply. Why would we be finding barium and aluminum and other chemicals in our drinking water and have man-made clouds persisting for 20 hours or more? That's why Golden says we will soon see more weather modification programs, including geoengineering, in the near future. The U.S. Senate right now calling for more weather modification programs. And while scientists say it's one way to reduce greenhouse gases, opponents say the consequences could be devastating.
All of these things change the growing cycles. Peterson says altering the amount of sunlight that hits the earth will lead to damaged crops, dead and dying trees, and the disappearance of honeybees. Then I think we're going to be in more trouble than ever before. So is it a contrail or a conspiracy? No matter who or what you believe, thousands of people are left wondering, looking to the cloudy skies for an answer that is clear. Heidi Hemet, Fox 31 News. Well, the U.S. military has been known to manipulate the weather in the past during the Vietnam War. They used cloud seeding to make it rain over supply routes used by the North Vietnam. How can I look my children in the eyes? And not try to shed the light on this issue, knowing every breath they take is, is laden with these metals. I have been forced to conclude that there is no greater or no more immediate threat to anything that lives and breathes than the global geoengineering programs short of nuclear catastrophe. Geoengineering is defined as the artificial modification of the Earth's climate. Geoengineers are proposing spraying 10 to 20 million tons of toxic aluminum and other substances into our sky for the stated goal of cooling our planet. So let me distinguish these two different uh, kinds of geoengineering as clearly as I can. So the first one is what we call solar radiation management, and that's the idea that you could put reflective, mostly reflective particles or other means to make the Earth whiter, effectively to increase the Earth's reflectivity, reducing the amount of, of, of heat that's absorbed by the sun, and therefore exerting some overall cooling tendency on the Earth. I think, the, though, the initial results of climate models indicate that reflection of sunlight away from the Earth can offset most climate change in most places most of the time. But it will damage some places. We've mostly thought about sulfur, and nevertheless, there might be some good reasons to think about aluminum. It turns out, first of all, there's been a lot of work on the environmental consequences of aluminum in the stratosphere. There's a bunch of papers going back to the 70s that look at the radiative and ozone-destroying uh, ozone destroying properties of aluminum in the stratosphere, and those make you think it might be useful. Do this in just a jet in a very simple way. Make high-quality aluminum particles just by spraying aluminum vapor out, which oxidizes. So it's certainly, in principle, What you're seeing right there is um, two chemtrail planes chasing after another plane. Um, here's a couple of French planes. Um, these planes will show you how aerosols can be turned on and off. Um, very obvious here. A plane just turned on the aerosol spray. The other one had it on. The other two have nothing coming out at all. And uh, this is obviously an aerosol sunk in there. That plane turned it off. That plane turned it on. All four planes are flying. All four have an exhaust. Yet, now here, here you've got two planes spraying, chasing another plane. The other plane is in the middle to the right a little bit. You can see it there. It's just a small dot. Same speed. The altitude's probably exactly the same, or possibly the altitude of the plane that's not spraying anything is higher. Now, you know, a lot of people, pilots, everybody else, will come on board and they'll say, well, it's just a contrail. It's just normal exhaust. Well, there you've got the plane stopped spraying right there, and the other plane continues to fly. Okay, Mr. Pilots and debunkers, where is that other plane? Did it just turn the engine off? I don't think so. It stopped spraying. So they started the spray right there. Does that mean that the temperature suddenly changed there? And Oh wait, okay, the temperature changer, oh wait, but the other plane's right at the same altitude and it's still spraying. Uh, no temperature change uh, happened there. That other plane stopped spraying. There is a growing citizen's movement uh, demanding an explanation of chemtrails. And I talked to my NSA buddies at Fort Carson, Peterson Air Force Base at Buckley, where I was actually their doctor taking care of the pilots flying and spraying the chemtrails. So I know it's real if anybody says. It's not the same as conducting some localized 
uh, test for some defensive project. This is open air operations. It's not a test. This is this this thing is in place. Talking about this a few years ago was extremely dangerous. Now that we have YouTube and more social networking devices, uh, this is really getting out in such a way that they can't control a thing over this because they can't control people now talking about the elephant in the room, what is so obvious to, to all of us. There's a feeling uh, from that area that the state doing all of these weather modification programs might not be doing it for the benefit of the citizens of Texas and other states that they may impact as well. Well, many of the planes that we're seeing here in Abilene will actually turn whatever they're spraying on and off right before our eyes. I mean, you'll see a plane up there flying like normal, and then all of a sudden it starts spraying. We've seen them fly off into the distance and then loop around and fly back again. These are not your typical planes with a preordained path destination from city to city. Someone needs to explain to me why do they stop traveling in one particular direction and then loop around and, and come back again. They perform this behavior so many times that we start seeing the tic-tac-toe grids in the sky. We're witnessing the giant X's. And I mean, Rosalind, when you and I grew up, these contrails naturally dissipated in a few seconds or perhaps a minute max. But these things expand, they grow bigger, and before you know it, the entire sky is overcast. That's correct. And they, they are there all day. They do lose the loop um, around um, our county and our state. We follow them at times with spotters in different areas watching the planes loop come back around and we know from the FAA records that uh, the jets from commercial airlines fly in straight lines and coming across their county, our county, there aren't many and they stay mostly in certain patterns. The jets that we see leaving the persistent jet contrails move in directions that normal jets wouldn't fly because it would use too much fuel and put them off schedule. And the jets that we see here do loops. We've got pictures of them looping the same X's and cross hatches. But I believe that some of that, uh, not only are they looking for keeping something in the air almost all the time, but we feel that some of the markings are to mark the start and stop areas for their programs so that they can watch their experiments either from satellite or the ground. lost sunshine hitting the planet right now is beyond belief. If people look up the term global dimming, they will see that fully 20% of the sun's rays that reached the planet several decades ago are no longer reaching the planet. I mean, that's a profound change that few people even know is. Where is this mountain of metal coming from? Why is asthma, ADD, Alzheimer's, autism, all elements related in many studies to aluminum or particulate inhalation, why are these, el why are these ailments going off the charts? with no apparent ex explanation. Why has respiratory mortality in the continental United States gone from eighth on the list to third in six years? And no one seems to ask any questions why everybody, uh, every other person has uh, asthma now, why every other commercial on TV is, a, is an allergy medication. One of the things that geoengineering is about when you're environmentally doing something with the atmosphere is that you can be engaged in weather modification. Historically, weather modification in the United States began to be looked upon in the 1940s as something that people would want to do. And so they started looking at making it enhancing snow, enhancing rain. They started looking at hurricane control. There was a whole bunch of projects in the 40s that started 
One was Project Storm Fury, which turned into a disaster when they tried to modify a hurricane. I'm Mark McCandlish. And for the better part of 30 years, I worked in the aerospace and defense industry. I had a secret clearance twice during my career. Some of the technology that I saw or uh, participated in the creation of tends to play a role in um, some of the, the things that are used to control the weather. The very distribution process is being employed in the aerosol campaign, manipulating the weather, crops, um, you know, taking over the, the, uh, the food production or controlling the food production, the military applications. The process evolved when they realized in the, in the 1800s that you can put things into the environment that will influence the uptake of moisture and where it drops out of the atmosphere again. Scott Stevens. So I uh, was a television weatherman for 20 years. These chemtrails are absolutely required to impact whatever weather event they were designing. And the trails were an absolute necessary ingredient for them to achieve their weather modification goals. So we're finding the aerosols the metal particulates, all of those can be used and, and leveraged to create weather events that are several standard deviations or outside what would be typically normal. When the geoengineering really got underway with the Russians in the mid-70s, we ended up with snow in Miami. We ended up you know, with frost deep into Mexico. You know, the bizarreness of the weather really exploded on the scene when, uh, when weather engineering got going in the mid-70s. When you push and pull the climate with these, these manipulation programs, of which there's a mountain of data to corroborate their existence, then, then you start to have massive fluctuations in the system. And we saw in March in the continental U.S. there were 15,232 temperature records broken. That's profound. Some of the daytime highs, the former records were broken by as much as 32 degrees. Don't people wonder? what in the world is going on? Whether they want to make it snow at 45, 46, 47 degrees. I remember when 38, 39 was a big deal. Those kind of snowfalls in the upper 30s, and now that's been pushed into the 40s. There's a patent called Ice Nucleation for Weather Modification. This is a patent from NASA. It can be found online in its full form. This patent is for the creation of artificial snowstorms from what would have been rainstorms. However preposterous it sounds to people, if they look up Chinese create snowstorms, they will find a, a, a long list of articles where the Chinese Bureau of Weather Modification openly admitted that they were creating snowstorms until they did a billion dollars worth of damage in Beijing. So my question would be, if the Chinese can do this, and NASA has a patent for the same purpose, why would we believe snow events here are natural when it's snowing now regularly at 45 degrees, sometimes 50 degrees, heavy, wet, concrete snow that's full of aluminum, full of barium, full of strontium. Consider the ice pack in their first aid kit that can sit dormant at room temperature for decades until the chemicals are mixed together, at which time it creates ice. As an on-air meteorologist, I had a responsibility to my audience. There were storms that were not behaving as they were modeled or they historically would have re responded. If you can control where moisture is collected and where it's dropped, so to speak, in the form of rain or any other kind of precipitation, then you can really, uh, you can do everything. You can steer the weather system. If you want to be able to manipulate the weather, one of the things we know about the materials that are being used in the aerosols, we, we've seen Everything from aluminum oxide, barium salts, strontium, copper sulfate, uh, potassium iodide, um, a number of different kinds of things, each of which have different levels of reactivity with the moisture in the air. Some 
uh, like aluminum oxide, tends to sequester the moisture. The aluminum oxide nanoparticles, which are microscopically fine and uniform in size, uh, attract the humidity, the moisture in the air, and they can. it basically forms like a nucleation process where the moisture condenses on these particles. The, with cloud seeding, the cooling will be achieved by making clouds reflect a bit more sunlight back to space than they would otherwise, and less sunlight reaching the surface would tend to cool the planet. These aerosol particle act, particles act as something called cloud condensation nuclei, and um, this is, these are sites where these particles act as sites where cloud drops can form. Well, the one thing that we know has happened is because these are nanoparticles and they float like mad with a little bit of uh, moisture added to them, they go over the continental divide and they dump all of California's rain into the Mississippi Valley, which is the reason they're having floods and tornadoes and fierce storms and odd weather back east. The effect here in California is drought. Now then if you hit that area of the sky with a, a beam of a particular kind of radiation and you can heat those particles up just like heating up you know, your, your cup of coffee in the microwave, these particles begin to vibrate and resonate if you use the right frequency of, of uh, RF energy, that they then heat the surrounding air and they will take all of that air and the moisture that's in it to a higher altitude where it's much colder and it'll condense and then become a low pressure system. And as the storm approaches, the high begins to recede and then they're running the flights back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and literally seeding the leading edges of the cirrus. So the cirrus canopy is accentuated. That cirrus canopy, which would maybe be two or 300 miles out ahead, of a, out ahead of a cold front, is now 400, 450 miles. Based on geoengineering data, it would appear the Pacific Northwest gets an excessive amount of, of the fallout from these programs because much of the weather, much of the precipitation and the storm tracks and the jet stream move across us. So as stated by globally recognized geoengineers like David Keith, that, that that's the type of area they would want to see these particulates as incoming fronts start to uh, cover landfall. And that's exactly what we see here. When there's any kind of incoming front, we see jets everywhere. And also, uh, influence what happens locally with the atmosphere by um, painting the materials that these aerosols are made of with different kinds of radio frequency or RF energy, radar, microwave, the HARP system. You know, HARP is um, uh, an array, a field of antennas, uh, radio frequency antennas. They're 72 feet tall and they have a cross dipole across the top that's about 60 feet in each direction. 180 of these are in the array uh, today, so you can imagine this field of, of uh, antennas. What happens is by firing uh, each one, they, they produce radio frequency energy that normally comes off of an antenna, spreads out rather rapidly. Same principle. Principles in physics would be like a flashlight shining on a wall. You know, you start with a narrow beam, and by the time you hit the wall, you've got a wide beam. The idea with HARP is to get it to focus or concentrate that radio frequency energy so it doesn't spread out, so you can hold it tighter together and then manipulate it in very specific ways. Weather control is a, a, a broad topic, so there's lots of ways to control and manipulate weather. HARP is, is one of them, because you also have private sector companies getting into this business of weather modification. In the case of HARP, do you need, uh, people always ask me, you know, do you need uh, particulates to burst in the atmosphere to, to make more effective? You, you actually don't. Uh, would it make things more possible? Could you enhance certain effects? Probably so. Could you control energy distributions more efficiently? Probably so, because you're putting in conductors or you're putting in reflectors, you're putting in uh, particulate material. If you've ever experienced a hailstorm and you've picked up one of the hailstones and you slice it open with a razor blade, you'll see that it's layer upon layer upon layer of ice. Now, hail is usually formed where you have a low pressure system where there's a tremendous updraft of air. When the air gets warmed up by the sunlight ahead of the storm, the air rises, it takes the moisture that's in the air 
up to a higher altitude where it's much colder, the uh, moisture begins to condense into water droplets, but the updraft is so powerful that the water is carried to extreme altitudes where it freezes. And it begins to fall, and as it falls, it it starts to be caught up in the updraft again, so it's circulated up into the air again. And so each time it's, it's lofted up into the atmosphere, more of the moisture that is condensing on the outside of this, this nuclei of ice begins to form another layer, another layer. And each time it's caught back in the updraft, it goes up again and it gets another layer of ice. And so if you have a system like HARP working in conjunction with aerosols, uh, chemtrails that are spraying in the air, you can actually create updrafts that are so powerful that you can have these hailstone circulation patterns going over and over again where you get hailstones the size of baseballs or even softballs. Weather has always been a strategic desire to control by the generals, whether it was uh, Napoleon marching towards Moscow or Hitler in his Russian campaign, or our own Pacific fleet trying to uh, understand typhoons and use them uh, for our strategic advantage. War and weather are very closely connected, and they've been connected ever since about 1812 or so, maybe earlier than that. Hannibal had to face the snows in the Alps, and so there's a long history of weather and warfare interactions. Environmental manipulation is like the ultimate um, method of covert warfare because you can literally shut down food production. You can create a situation where the people within a country revolt against their own government and you're invited in to mop up the mess. The issue of owning the weather by 2025, which is a military publication, we've quoted it as far back as I think 94, 95 even. Um, but you go back to these earlier reports and you look at sort of what was the objective. And the objective is exactly that, control the battlefield environment. Uh, environmental factors give you an absolute advantage. Uh, if you can weaken your adversary before you have to fire the first bullet, maybe you even win the war. Whether it's incredibly historic sandstorms when we're invading Iraq, or you want to drought out or flood out a dictator that you're not happy with, believe that this is a full-scale secret operation that includes not only the U.S., but Europe and the rest of the world? Well, that's apparent because you can see the, the pictures from all over the world, and I get them constantly. Uh, some areas are worse than others. The excuse for this is, number one, weather modification, number two, to save us from global warming, and number three, to save us from the terrorists. Uh, a lot of these programs, of which there are many patterns and which has been uh, designated as wake vortex simulation carried out by NASA Langley Research Center. Uh, many of these operations uh, and the patents go on to explain how if there is a, a biological attack by a uh, terrorist at some point that these exercises and practices will in a sense save us with the spider webbery uh, that comes down from the aerosol spraying potentially gathering the chemical mass spray that could be sprayed on any given population. The problem with that is uh, the terrorists don't have the means to deliver this. They don't have the access to deliver this over the American populace per se. And the only people who have been doing this, that is biological experiments on the American people, is the military themselves, which has been admitted from everything from Operation Shad to the spraying that happened in San Francisco, I believe back in the 60s and the 70s, that literally killed people. Um, again, I may not be able to, to uh, ascribe intent, but what I can say is that it is, it is expected that there will be increased mortality as well as the potential of a huge host of unknown uh, pathogens uh, that we are assigned. Could a strange substance found by with these lab results about the high being levels part of, of a barium found in our sample. We decided to contact the Louisiana Department of Health and Safety. The official explanation here is that jet contrails, 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 contrails are causing strange lines in the sky. What effects and barium has on the body? Short-term exposure can lead to anything from stomach to chest pains. Long-term exposure causes blood pressure problems. Ryan addressed concerns by chemtrail researchers that barium could be meant to wear down a person's immune system. We're talking about dominating our air supply without the human consent in a, in a way that is, is difficult for many of us certainly to conceive and certainly many of us refuse to accept it.
even in the light of sufficient and overwhelming evidence. can create uh, weather systems that are so severe they uh, culminate in battlefield denial uh, where the enemy is not able to use the roads or the bridges or or get through the environment because the weather is so severe uh, and you can you can use the weather to destroy his crops uh, deny him a food source destabilize his population because people get hungry when they're hungry they get angry and nasty and they don't like what's happening. So there's lots of different things that you can do with the materials. It's all how you use them in the environment, how you apply it. One of the biggest concerns of early cloud seeding uh, weather control activities by the General Electric Corporation came from their lawyers who thought that the corporation was totally vulnerable to lawsuits because if they started to make fair or foul weather, the people down below in Massachusetts or downwind of uh, Schenectady could uh, institute massive lawsuits that could put GE out of business. So the, the first response to weather control from their in-house lawyers was to shut it down, was to give it, the project to the military and ask them to do it with the GE lawyers only being the consultants on the project. So they were allowed to uh, suggest and, and uh, design certain activities, but they weren't allowed to touch anything or throw anything out of the plane. The United States government during the Vietnam War perfected weather modification techniques and also they perfected releasing toxic chemicals like Agent Orange over many areas to defoliate land, trees, grasslands and other areas. But this is uh, technology that does come up and it comes up when, when, when you see that the technology advanced far enough to where the practicality of utilizing it in the battlefield environment the, and the temptation by administrations. I mean, the, the, the best covert war is using the environment itself uh, against your adversary. It was a military moment, and it was actually from pretty recent history. And this was the U.S. military um, thinking that they might be able to control the, the monsoon over Vietnam during that conflict. Uh, and so only a few, a handful of uh, top-level military advisors and the president were uh, informed that they were going to try to, to make it rain over the Ho Chi Minh Trail and try to have some military advantage by doing this kind of intervention. When you start talking about manipulating the environment, we have treaties that go back to the mid-70s that forbid this, number one, as weapons of war. So the perfection of weather modification took place, but it became apparent that using weather modification for wartime purposes was not acceptable to the United States government and other nations of the world. So therefore, the NMOD treaty came into being and was signed by the United States government after passing Congress. The reason it was signed and implemented was because it would ban warfare, weather modification techniques and use during times of war. Almost all of our treaties that we've signed, including the non-proliferation, counter-proliferation treaties, chemical treaties, you know, the ones that were signed recently, last few years, uh, you know, back uh, maybe a decade now, I guess time goes, but uh, they had domestic exemptions, uh, and so does the environmental treaty, uh, where you can do whatever you want in your own territorial boundaries. When I mean, you start manipulating weather in one part of, a, of the planet, it doesn't look on the ground and say, oh yeah, wait, wait, this is the boundary of a political boundary. It fails to recognize those. So you start to talk about uh, geophysics and manipulating the planet itself. Th then it's a question of those kinds of exemptions shouldn't even be allowed. Meteorology and the military have a very long history, as I said, and it goes uh, into the strategic advantage that multiplies your, your traditional force, that is your, 
your armament into uh, using nature to your advantage as well. They want to create a, a, a storm in the southeast, then they'll start engineering out over the North Pacific. That's where the trailies will be, because you want to work out several days ahead of time so you have less input and you multiply that over a couple of days, you can have a big result in, in five days' time. So small input, upstream, big result, downstream. And one of the rules is always work with what's coming. Don't try to necessarily work against it. You can kill a storm in place. That's easy to do with HARP. You just change the polarization, you change the ionization of the atmosphere, and the storm will fall apart. It will affect the, the setting up of the storm tracks, the jet stream, the location of the storms. And so you end up with an intervention on the solar side of things would uh, pretty directly begin to affect the weather patterns. And so climate control or attempted climate control and weather control are, lie on this very large spectrum of intervention. It's also true that if you can forecast climate, you can control a lot of futures markets and you could know if you had the best information or if you had some leverage over what the climate system is going to turn out to be you would be able to invest in advance in all your crop futures and your agricultural activities and, and not just agriculture but weather effects. I think it's something like 80% of the U.S. economy is weather sensitive and so all kinds of businesses would like to see some weather edge, some uh, ad advantageous uh, information that they would have. It's absolutely entirely possible to profit from uh, uh, the weather. Uh, my name is Michael Agney. I'm an independent trader. Trading commodities at the CME Group, member of the Chicago Board of Trade, and have traded derivatives and futures cash for over 15 years. Uh, weather derivatives are financial instruments that firms would use to hedge risk concerned with uh, adverse weather conditions. The first weather derivative was originally traded by Enron back in 1997. Weather derivatives started in 1999 at the CME Group. Big utilities, reinsurers to hedge against hurricanes or tornadoes or flooding, some, some sort of catastrophe, hedging uh, against a cooler summer or a warmer winter. Let's just say I was insuring a product for $5 million, no matter what it was. Let's say if I was a utility company, a farmer, whatever it was. Let's say I had $5 million worth of crop, but I can do derivatives that are worth double that amount, and I can control the, the effects to where I collect on the insurance that's worth $10 million as opposed to selling the crop for $5 million. Yes, I could definitely profit from that. 2010, 2011, Southern Illinois, Missouri, those, those you know, we had a high peak of tornadoes and and those types of adverse weather conditions definitely raised the price of commodities as well as drove the volatility which also raises the price of commodities. You're going to make more money if a crop fails. You're creating insurance that's over the price of what your crop is worth, let's say. So what, if you can control the weather, you control how these products grow. And if you had an insight to how these products were actually seeded and what products you used to actually grow those items, corn, soybeans, and you can control that market, it's unlimited profit potential if you can control the weather. If you want to send you know, cold into the Midwest, you buy up pipeline capacity, you buy up options on heating and cooling degree days, you buy derivatives off of, off of rainfall. There are mechanisms that you can make hundreds of billions of dollars annually and defray a huge chunk of the cost of this just on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange playing with derivatives in the weather market. Weather derivatives are basically, you're betting that there's going to be a weather disaster and you're betting uh, that it's going to occur within a particular time frame in a particular location and then, you know, the money that you put up basically is like a bet. It's like a wager saying that uh, this, this incident's going to happen here and then when it does happen, there's a big payoff. And that big payoff is something that motivates people to continue to participate in this kind of thing and maybe even feed the very process that's causing the bad weather to happen. Particularly if there's a connection between the people that are seeding the clouds and the people that are making investments. This is a new opportunity. It's a new tool for, for investors. You know, even if uh, someone has no interest in, you know, going on the offensive side and buying things, um, it definitely behooves them to be aware of what's going on out there. The extreme weather is here. 
you know, and it's not going to reverse itself. The weather event has to be severe. Ionosphere Keating, in fact, these instruments, um, when they were first utilized, which is in the former Soviet Union back in the 70s, they, they started out, and they still call these ionosphere heaters because in one mode of operation, you can literally create above this instrument on the ground, you can heat an area 30, up to 30 miles in diameter in the ionosphere. So you heat it up, and by heating it, it literally raises it. So then imagine this column moving up several hundred kilometers out, and then the lower atmosphere begins to rush in and fill that vacant space, that void. And as a result, you're altering pressure systems for you know, quite, a, quite a distance, which of course alters the weather. You're also able, if a jet stream is coming in the air, you're able to alter its course. And if you alter a jet stream, even a small amount, then the swing factor on the other end, you can move it. So you're moving storms, say, out of the Midwest, onto the East Coast, or this kind of thing, by just swinging it high in, 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 in terms of its flow and, and getting it redirected. Okay, so now if we look at precipitation, much has been made of this issue of, of uh, damage from precipitation. Which the particulates that these trails inter have, uh, have introduced into the sky are, let's just say the storms can develop more violently, more quickly, um, in places that are not necessarily as uh, where you would expect them to be. And so we see more flooding. We see more intense droughts. We see rainfall rates of one to, you know, two and a quarter inches an hour that are just bizarre. And sometimes even rainfall, you know, an inch and a quarter a minute is just unheard of. And so you have an area that's already been heated by the sun's rays, and then you have the aerosol drift in over that area, and it's reflecting both ways. It's reflecting the heat of the sun back out, but it's also trapping the heat that's already been created there by the sunlight. So it will actually create more heat and trap heat inside and closer to the atmosphere. It can actually exacerbate global warming. So the agenda was drought. The agenda was to kill the storm, at least in that one particular spot. You see a tremendous and significant loss of property and uh, crop production. Uh, many times this will cause farms to go out of business. And when farmers go out of business, they usually have to sell. And then if there's somebody waiting in the wings to buy their land and then uh, turn that uh, land over to the production of genetically modified crops, you can see where there would be kind of a strategic advantage there. There's something that happened in the Midwest, and I'm sure everybody's heard about the flooding in the Midwest, and what happened is um, George Soros and his big corporate monolith went in and started buying up the farmland. So not only is it, is it creating all these stresses, it appears to be a corporate land grab in other words, when the farmers, the small farmers, go out of business, they're wiped out through these droughts and everything, then the big guys come in, buy up the land. And if you think of Western history, uh, there's a lot of it concerning water rights and even water wars. And so they were shooting about access to uh, uh, water to, to water your livestock. And now people are thinking, or at least the people who are involved in weather control sometimes think about uh, uh, the river of moisture above our heads, and geez, if we could just tap that. But that, that too is a, uh, a, a water right that would involve uh, access to uh, the people that, that, that felt that maybe they had prior uh, rights over it. You're reducing the food security of people through deploying these kinds of approaches that potentially two billion people could have their food disrupted by such interventions. I've been an uh, organic farmer my entire life. And I've been, um, in the last eight years, been certified organic. And so I've been growing food in a way that feels healthy, where I have the most energy. And now it's not so healthy. I want to pass a really nice, healthy soil, rich soil, earth onto the children and have it be fertile. Эксперимент номер 437. 
предполагаемая продолжительность. Никто не может скрыться. When I called NASA yesterday and I spoke with someone in your Washington DC office, I was told that he's scared to death. He's going to denounce his citizenship and go back to the Philippines. Okay. That's what I was told by NASA yesterday when I called. Okay. And directly not, from did you your office. that conversation with their knowledge? Uh, well, I'm sorry? Did you record that conversation with their knowledge? Uh, are you recording my conversation with that knowledge, sir? I'm sorry? No, I'm not recording any conversation. You're not recording any record. conversation with my knowledge, and NASA isn't either, and you can't get through it anyway. If you want to leave a message, it rings and rings and then hangs up on you. Same with Wallop Island. So I would love to leave a message there. Could you give me a direct uh, answer? Because it says you're the scientist here on the NASA website. Yeah, I'm involved in the project, but... You are a scientist, so then and you know that this is experimental? You've never done it before? No, it's been done in the 1970s. It's been done in the, recently in the 1990s. Oh, that's not what it said on this article here. Three, two, one, zero, plus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. It hasn't been done since 1970, the lithium release in the daytime. Why would it be done now then, sir? That's scary. Uh, detailed information. If you could please send your comments by email. Okay, you like? will you respond to my email if I send them? Happy to answer them, yes. You will. Okay, what was your e email, sir? Douglas.e.roland. Mm -hmm. D-O-U-G-L-A-S. Douglas dot, I'm sorry? E. Uh-huh. Dot Roland. R-O-W-L-A-N-D. Uh-huh. At, uh... So dot gov. I'm sorry? NASA dot gov. N-A-S-A dot G-O-V. Okay. Well, I will be expecting an email back from you then, sir. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's very important. We, we, we communicate what we're doing to the public. We're very interested in making sure everyone knows what we're doing. We're not, um, we're a civilian space agency dedicated to science and research and so on. So we're very, uh, very keen to make sure that the taxpayers know what we're doing and everything. So. Well, you know, when the, when the article came out in the major newspapers, including the Huffington Post, there was no mention of lithium, not one, not one mention of lithium until I heard the recording of the actual, I, I listened to it. I listened to the rockets go off. I had no idea there was going to be a lithium dispersed until I heard payload lithium disperse. Good indicators of chemical deploys. And lithium on Terrium proved divine had been deployed. Okay. RSO TD OSS requests to declare the area clear and release the roadblocks. TD concurs if RSO does. RSO concurs. Oh, I copies. Yeah, the science team reports out that they do see the lithium trails. These lithium trails allow them to look at the winds and that uh, of the ionosphere. And uh, these winds are believed to be the carriers of the dynamic. Uh, well, make sure everyone knows that we see the lithium from the airplane. Roger that. We've got good sine waves on the electric field. PI copies. Right. There was lithium dispersed, and I'd be happy to talk to you about it. I think you might be under some misconceptions about what we're doing, but I'm happy to tell you any details that you need. Well, I know that it says in your article that you're doing it for communications. Okay, I'm happy to talk to you more about it. There, there are many reasons we're doing it. Okay. We don't understand how the wind in the upper atmosphere moves. Mm -hmm. In these chemtrails, there's different kinds of chemtrails, as you probably know, different trails at night we use and different trails during the day. The wind blows them around. They glow either on their own or from scattered sunlight. We take pictures and we can see how the wind trail moves around. And we use that to, to infer what the wind is. Just like if you were taking a picture of an airplane contrail. You can use that to see how the wind was blowing up at those altitudes. This is much higher altitude, so we use these chemical trails. 
And what, what is the, the purpose of knowing what the wind's going to do in the ionosphere? The purpose is the ionosphere is really to understand our planet. It's very fundamental science. We're trying to understand every day we know there's electric currents that flow over the head. They're just naturally there. They've been there for you know, ever since the Earth had an atmosphere and a magnetic field. And the wind is driven by the sun. The sun heats the atmosphere. The wind blows. And every day that wind drives an electric current. And we're trying to understand what causes that, essentially how does it work in detail. And also importantly, when the sun becomes active with lots of sunspots and lots of uh, magnetic activity, that changes the wind pattern and changes the electric current. So we want to understand both what it is on a regular day when there's no solar activity and then what it is when there's a lot of solar activity. Is there some other kind of a way that you can use it without using dispersing the lithium? We're researching other ways. The lithium is actually harmless to the environment, and we could t show you more about that. But it is tricky to use because we have to. It's very faint. Uh, you can't see it with your naked eye. You have to, you know, have special cameras to see it and so on. So we don't like to use it for that reason. It's hard. It's, in other words, it's hard measurement to make. We're researching other ways to put sensors directly on the rocket to measure the wind. And those are ongoing. We're trying to develop those now. In fact, one of the purposes of this mission was to do that. Okay. Well, you've explained it to me then. I, I, I don't agree with it, but I appreciate you explaining it to me. Well, too, if you have, if you have detailed questions, anything you want. Okay, I will. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to research a little more, and I will email you, and I appreciate you taking the time out to speak to me today, sir. At your call. It's not often we get to hear from members of the public and people who are really interested and concerned with what we're doing. I, I wish, really appreciate your time. I wish more people would call. I really do. I've called my senators. I've called my governor. You can't get through to anyone, sir. You can't get through to anybody. Yeah. I go to my city council. I live in rural North Carolina. They don't care. They, 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 they laugh you out of there. there. There's no other recourse for us, sir, to, as, unless to t talk to people directly and find out what is going on because we're paying for it. Just, just look, ask for the science department. Well, I, I don't know what department they're in, but Larson, L-A-R-S-E-N, Miguel Larson is the lead. And he we would be, as a government agency, we would not be allowed, you know, to do anything that would be harmful. So he, he's under strict control and that sort of thing. So he can explain it to you. He can even show you around, that sort of thing. My statement was that it's criminal, and whoever's doing this should uh, be um, charged with a criminal uh, act uh, that this could kill. Uh, thousands if not millions of people eventually. I mean, if you, you're inducing Alzheimer's uh, disease on a worldwide scale and you're inducing a number of diseases just from breathing it, I mean, within the lungs you can produce asthma, you produce chronic lung disease. People who have pre-existing chronic lung disease will precipitously get worse because aluminum, as it enters the, the epithelium of the lungs, uh, is going to produce intense inflammatory reactions. And that's going to produce a worsening of their pulmonary conditions. Also, the, the uh, aluminum is absorbed into the bloodstream, uh, can be deposited in the heart. People with heart failure would get worse. Uh, people with hypertension would get worse. Uh, numerous diseases could be uh, precipitated and worsened uh, by such uh, an insane policy. But it is criminal. It's a criminal. I was asked permission to do this. This was not announced publicly. This was not. Uh, entered into a public forum uh, so <clears throat> these health uh, issues could be discussed. Uh, they just secretly uh, have done it on a worldwide uh, scale of, of, uh, of an enormous proportion, dropping uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of tons of this, uh, of this product in the atmosphere. Well, the skeptics usually are people who are involved with government somehow, and, and that's their job. Their job is to debunk it. Uh, the problem is, is that we have people who are trained uh, biologists who are taking water samples, like you say, from lakes and streams. Uh, we have biologists from all over the world that are sampling it from the leaves of trees and plants and uh, the fauna uh, in Hawaii, uh, uh, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, in Arizona. So they're doing it all over. All of them are finding the same things. And, of course, we have records of, of uh, the levels of aluminum in the lakes and streams and vegetation that go back um, many, many decades, and so it's easy to compare. And what we see is over the last uh, 10 years has been an astronomical increase in the aluminum, not just a minor variation, but an astronomical increase in the aluminum level. And, uh, you know, when you look at it uh, worldwide and you see the same thing about it, it's irreversible. Once it enters the streams and the waters and the plants, uh, there's no way to remove it. Uh, you, you know, you've destroyed uh, massive amounts of uh, the environment.
Island. 